Bama Unit Salute! What's up, guys? Welcome back to the channel. Smash that up. Obviously, it helps out the algorithm, but it helps BC know that you're fully amplified for this impromptu, very special AEW Dynamite 5824 review. I'm not always able to catch Dynamite. I was able to catch it last night after my New York Knicks defeated the Indiana Pacers in Game 2 in an all-out war in the playoffs. My Knicks are up 2-0. And after this massive game last night, I was actually able to catch Dynamite in a replay. So I said, if I'm catching this, I might as well take some notes and maybe I can find some time at some point to cut a review for you guys. So that's what I did. I took my notes on Dynamite last night and I made sure that I had time to cut this review for you guys. So that's what we're going to do, man. Dynamite 5824, it's coming up. And before I get into that, I want to discuss real quick Monday Night Raw, a huge sigh of relief has ushered upon the shores of WWE. Monday Night Raw officially has found a home for September through December. Quarter four, as they call it in the corporate world. Of course, if you guys don't know, the deal between WWE and the USA Network for the rights to Monday Night Raw ends in September. Their new deal is with Netflix. That does not start until January 1st, 2025. That left Monday Night Raw without a home from September through December. There was talk for a while because USA was not extending that deal. Of course, September is when your new shows have to premiere. You know, the, the weather's going to change. It's going to get colder. You want to you wanna get your audience familiar with new shows and hope that those shows take off. If you extend Raw for three months, then your new shows are not going to debut until January. By then, your audience has already found other things back in September. I hope that makes sense. That's why USA Network did not want to extend Raw at first. And this left WWE in a position where there was real talks that they may have to go dark for three and a half months, which means Raw completely taken off the air the next time you see it will be months later when it debuts on Netflix. There was real talk that it was going dark. I would have loved that. This would have been a perfect reset. Build suspense every week. People would be thinking, I can't wait to see Raw. How's it going to look? How's it going to be? How's the feel? You haven't seen a lot of the wrestlers in months? This would have been an awesome reset. They would have lost some money, though, um, in, in many aspects. But that's no longer a concern um, late yesterday, word broke that the USA Network, NBC Universal, Comcast, was able to strike a deal with the WWE. They are going to extend Monday Night Raw from September through December. This will take WWE into their Netflix deal. So there is an extension. Raw is staying on the USA Network till the end of the year. That is a massive announcement that was levied yesterday. And... and more specifically, too, I want to break down the number that we're hearing. This deal is for $25 million. So USA Network is getting a massive deal. Because if you break it down, the current deal, supposedly anyway, is between $250 to $260 million a year. That's what USA is giving to WWE. Approximately $250 to $260 million every single year. It's a five-year deal. So if you break that into every three month increment, every three months, it's basically about 60 to $65 million, right? So if you look at the end of the year, it's a three month increment. They're getting this for 25 million, 60 to 65. And they're getting this three month period for 25. So that's what I mean. WWE really did not want to take raw off the air. And it looks like they're not going to need to do that. They're they're giving USA Network, NBC Universal, a massive cut, a massive deal. This is USA Network just made out like bandits, bro. So that is a huge update. Monday Night Raw staying with the USA Network, and uh, and they got a massive discount. All right, I'm gonna get a big swig of coffee, and we coming back with a very special. We don't get to do this often. But we're going to have a very special impromptu review of Dynamite 5824. Was this a good show? Did it deliver or did it not? Let's talk about it. So 
So, Dynamite 5824. This show starts with Trent Beretta versus Orange Cassidy. And the match itself, Cassidy wins with like a simplistic roll up on Beretta, something like that. It was post match where the fun began, though, right? Beretta puts an epic beat down onto Cassidy. Yeah, Beretta takes Cassidy, pile drives him on the top of the steel steps. Vicious, too. He lost his footing, it looked like. Beretta's right foot like went off and like landed on the second step, but it was almost like, all right, this is better footing anyway. So he did it that way. Either way, same result. Cassidy dome piece first on the top of that steel steps. It looked great. And then afterwards, he puts up the ring apron and he slingshots Cassidy into the framing underneath the ring of that apron. The steel framing. Cassidy gets slingshotted into it, basically like chest or throat first vicious then Beretta grabs a toolbox and I'm thinking this is great man just do this beat or Cassidy got the W Beretta's looking like a beast this should end with Cassidy absolutely laid out and instead as Beretta gets the toolbox Cassidy grabs a chair he crawls to a chair and then he's on his feet a minute after he just got slingshotted into the steel framing which was 30 seconds after getting dropped on his dome piece on the steel steps Cassidy is on his feet. That was the only thing wrong with that segment, and it was a massive wrong. What is Cassidy doing playing Superman? I know he's got the Superman punch, the orange punch, but but still. <laughs> orange punch, Superman punch, whatever you want to call it. You're not actually Superman. You're Orange Cassidy. You got dropped on your dome piece. Sell that. You should be selling that attack the rest of the night bare minimum. And a minute later, he's on his feet with a steel chair. Man, Beretta went from looking like a beast to just looking average AF again. I mean, after all that, Cassidy's back on his feet. Don Callis is backing off Cassidy. Chris Statlander comes out. Statlander is laying into Beretta verbally. Like, backing off Beretta, but more more than anything, just yelling at him. You idiot, what are you doing? Are you stupid? So one of the best parts of the night, Beretta looks right at Stat. This is, this, it was great. I wasn't expecting this. Looks right at Stat and slowly but loudly says, shut the f- up. <laughs> it was great, guys. Statlander's like, was blown away. What did you just say to me? Trent Beretta was not having any of Stat's verbal, verbal assault. So Statlander's trying to back off Beretta, at least verbally. Don Callis is backing off. Orange Cassidy, and that's how the segment ends. I still really enjoyed this segment. Match was all right, but it was the post-match beatdown. It was very unique, very good beatdown on Cassidy. I just wish Cassidy didn't jump up after 60 seconds and have a steel chair in his hand. And now I know, you say, BC, he was wobbly. He was still selling it, BC. Well, yeah, a little bit, thankfully. But, I mean, did you see the did you see the pile driver on top of the steel steps and then a subsequent slingshot into the framing, the steel framing underneath the apron. We never see that. It was vicious. And then he's just on his feet with a steel chair. Come on, we could sell that a little bit, a little bit better. Other than that massive botch toward the end of that segment, very good way to start the show. I said that was one of the best parts, right? That simplistic shut the f- up to stat. The best part of the show for BC was even more simplistic. It was just a 60-second spot in the parking lot. The Young Bucks were pulling up to the arena, right? The Elite. I think Okada was there in there as well. I think Jack Perry was there as well. But the camera in the back, um, they're pulling into the arena, pulling into the parking lot. And and they're looking for a parking spot. They're yelling. Young Bucks are, are berating uh, the parking lot employees, right? The parking lot attendants. Move, move, you mark. The employees are like, huh, me? Young Bucks are being total D-bags, and it fits their character, obviously. They have all the power, and they're pretty much pissing on all those individuals below them, right? So it fits them perfectly. So they're yelling at the parking lot attendees. They finally, attendants, and then they finally get to this one spot that's right by the door, and it's, it's VIP. It's elite parking. 
and they pull up. And sure enough, as we get closer, we see it's Tony Khan's reserved parking, literally a sign that says Tony Khan's reserved parking. And they pull up right into Tony Khan's reserved parking. Oh, this is perfect. This is our spot. What's that? Say? Oh, oh, Tony. Khan. Oh, he doesn't care, right? He's not going to. He's not here anyway, nor could he do anything about it. This is our spot. They literally took, they booted Tony Khan from his own show, bad enough, and then insult to injury, add salt to the wound, they take the dude's parking spot. And just the way that it was done is what popped BC. It was just like, again, 60 seconds, maybe 90 seconds top tops, but this was just so well done. Anyway, all right, I'll move on. All right, BC, man, it was 60 seconds. We're going to spend 60 minutes on that segment. <laughs> I just really enjoyed it. Can you tell? Next up, immediately after, was Kenny Omega from a hospital bed, and he announces, or at least lays down the challenge for anarchy in the arena at Double or Nothing, May 26th, Elite and Jack Perry, Okada, Bucks, Verse FTR and two members that will be named later in the night, which we'll get to in a few minutes. That was literally, I believe that closed the show. So we'll get to that in a couple of minutes. But Kenny Omega lays down this challenge again from a hospital bed and he literally phrases it um, elite versus team AEW, something, something to that effect. So they, they literally want you to know like this is AEW versus kind of this almost anti-AEW, which, by the way, later in the night we will get to was at hour number two. Bucks had a live microphone, and they wanted to make sure everybody knew they are not anti-AEW. They don't want bad for AEW. I'll, I'll give you guys an exact quote from what they said, but the way Omega stated it, pretty much wants you to know it's AEW versus these dudes. So the challenge laid down, we'll see if... The Elite accepted. That was the end of the night. We'll get to that in a few minutes. Then Tony Schiavone is up next. Uh, no, top of the ramp, not middle of the ring. Top of the ramp interviewing Serena Deeb. And you'd be surprised, my feelings on this segment. So Serena Deeb, top of the ramp, Tony Schiavone is interviewing her. Serena Deeb did an incredible job trying to sell this title match upcoming with Tony Storm. Deeb was talking about her journey to get back to pro wrestling, more specifically AEW, and how dire it was for a moment. She talked about having seizures, multiple seizures, with no explanation as to why. She went to many docks. Nobody had a reason. So obviously nobody was going to clear her to wrestle. And at that moment, wrestling was probably the furthest thing from her dome piece. There was a lot bigger obstacles and hurdles to, to, to get through and over than just pro wrestling. So it was not looking good for a while there for Deeb. And she was telling this story. Now, AEW's whole hope here is that everybody stops and listens to her words because that's only going to help you care more about the title match. Right? They're trying to tell you a story. It's just a much more deeper, much more heartfelt story. The problem is Edmonton, the crowd on hand, was not having it. And there was a lot of heckling, there was a lot of yelling, there was a lot of chants that had nothing to do with the promo. A lot of Euler chants, Edmonton again. So you had a lot of Euler chants. And for moments, it would knock it would knock Deeb off her game, but only for a moment. Then she'd get right back on her game, and she would hit all the points she was trying to make. So Deeb did fantastic to not just nail her promo, but also offset the crowd that just did not show up to hear a heartfelt, deep promo. They just did not want to hear it, a lot of that crowd. So she did really good. I got to give props to Deeb. And again, I didn't even know about all the seizures and no explanation and just how hard the road was for Deeb to get back. So that's why it was very captivating for BC. And then Tony Storm comes out. And this was just brilliant. Tony Storm is talking about how she's a charity case with her her boo-hoo story, basically. So she goes into her brassiere. She whips out cash and starts chucking it at Serena Deeb. And then, again, another really good part of the night came when Tony Storm looked right at Serena Deeb. And she says, this is a quote, Tony Storm. This is after Deeb just poured her heart out to everybody as to the road she had to take just to get back to wrestling. And Tony Storm looks right at her. 
And Tony Storm says, and I quote, Every, and she said it slowly, too. She really emphasized every word. And if you can just picture her accent, it just made it that much more better. Everything you've been through to get back to AEW, I couldn't give one solitary shit. <laughs> it was so well done. I couldn't even do it justice. It was so perfectly done. Absolutely ticked off Deeb. Deeb lays back into a right hand, lays Tony Storm out flat. One right hand. Tony Storm was knocked out so cleanly, laid out as if she got hit by a Mack truck and then ran over by a litter of school buses. Tony Storm was out. It was so well done. I really enjoyed this a lot more than it looked like Edmonton enjoyed it. But I think that's because, truthfully, as I always am with you guys, when I heard first that Storm was taking on Deeb for the championship, for that title, I thought initially, no thanks. I don't need to see it. Much respect to Tony Storm. Some of the best work she's been doing in her career is right now. And much respect, obviously, especially behind the scenes with Serena Deeb training so many of the females you see today, her knowledge for the business. But I just, it didn't excite me at all. It didn't intrigue me. Deeb, Tony Storm, I said no thanks. After seeing this one, this one back and forth promo, this one face off between the two, I'm now like, yes, please. Absolutely. Absolutely, I'm in. And I will catch that match. I don't know if I'm able to catch it live when it happens, but I will make sure I catch that match. I mean, that's what one face-off can do, one good back-and-forth promo uh, when it's well done. And Serena Deeb and Tony Storm just were just lights out in that promo. Perfectly done. I don't want to say perfectly, but near. If not perfect, that was nearly, especially with the crowd just not wanting a heartfelt promo. And I don't blame them, you know? They showed up to party, but it's pro wrestling. Sometimes you got to know when to tone it down and let the wrestlers tell their story. Sometimes it's not always just screaming and amplification. Sometimes you bring it down a few notches. And if you're patient, boom, Serena Deeb <laughs> laid out Tony Storm. So you got the amplification at the end of it anyway. Well done. They stuck with the ladies, actually. Mar Mariah May defeated Harley Cameron via pinfall. The best part of this match was right before the finish on the outside. May throws a beautiful right hand at Soraya that dropped the former Paige right where she stood. It wasn't as good as Serena Deeb's knockout punch onto Tony Storm. But it was a damn... I mean, if you guys see the footage, it's a really good right hand from May to Soraya. Didn't knock out Soraya, but planted her on her ass, man. She dropped like a stack of bricks. That was the best part of the match for BC, anyway. Um, and then post-match, again, Mariah May defeated Harley Cameron. And then post-match, Soraya and Harley put Das Boots to May. And then May's old tag partner, Mina Shirakawa of Stardom, hits the ring. <laughs> this is a little spitfire she hits the ring, evens the odds, and puts the outcast into retreat mode. And then there was a little bubbly popped uh, post-match. I couldn't, I couldn't help but think, too, when Mina had the bubbly popping off with Mariah. It was just like, wherever Mina is at the, at the club, like that's where the party is. That's where everybody is going to be. Because Mina showed up to rock and party. That's exactly what she did. I don't know enough about this Mina Shirakawa other than her history with Mariah and her placement in stardom. Um, other than that, I mean, obviously on the surface, she's ultra beautiful. She, she possesses um, great skill and talent. But other than that, you know, you, you kind of got to look at the books and see where she's at in stardom in her last like 50 matches, for instance. She's 30 out of 50 for Ws. So her last 50 matches, she's won 30 of them. And sometimes, you know, when you look at those, those W's and L's, you can got to get a placement on where the promoter sees individuals. So 30 of 50 is, is pretty good. That's a 60% winning percentage, I believe, if my Steiner math is correct. So we'll see if, you know, you really would like to be 70 plus. So we'll see if AEW and her work with this promotion 
whatever that may be going forward, we'll see if they can kind of tip the scale, get that closer to 70%. Pretty cool. Listen, this matchup, in all honesty, Mariah May versus Harley Cameron could have easily, if you just close your eyes and listen carefully, that could have been the sound of a lot of channels changing. But I don't believe that was the case because when this match was all said and done, everybody played their role nicely. It was actually a decent match. The whole segment in its totality was thoroughly entertaining. So I thought these these ladies absolutely, um, if not a home run, this was a solid triple by these ladies. Hour number one then ends with Malachi Black selling his feud with Adam Copeland in a badass vid package. I'm going to say this. I've said it a billion times. I'll say it a billion more. Singles Black destroys Trios Black. And I will plant my flag on the top of that hill every single time. I will say that. Singles Malachi Black trumps Trios Malachi Black. And I remember... Many, many months ago, Malachi Black was very honest, very candid with with fans. And he said, I don't know why I'm not in singles matches. It's not because I am telling them I want to be in trios. For some reason, I'm not booked as a singles wrestler. That's what he said. Malachi Black said that. So Tony Khan just didn't want to book him like that. Just wanted him to be in this trios thing. The problem with that, guys... And this is not just because I don't like trios divisions. I just, I'm not a big fan of six man tags. Once in a blue moon, I don't mind a six man tag. Today, today's pro wrestling, there's six man tags all the time because you just want to use everybody. You know, it's going to be high octane, fast paced. So everybody's going to ooh, ah, and say, this is awesome. But I don't need that. Just calm it down, like sell moves and just relax. Use more in ring psychology. You don't have to fly around the ring like a, like you're a cat toy. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> like you're a bouncing ping pong ball going every which way. It's not the fact that I, I just, I'm not a big fan of a trio's division. It's the fact that some people are much better to be utilized on their own. They're superstars. And I, I'm not trying to use a tacky word from another promotion, but a legit superstar. Malachi Black is a star. We knew that in WWE. That's why we were pissed that McMahon misused him. Got to AEW. We said, okay, he won't be a superstar here on his own. No. I mean, if we're all being honest, Khan absolutely misused him. To this point, you can always rectify that. And it looks like maybe we're starting to do that. But in a trio, man, okay, there, there's some good that could come from that. He's obviously a leader and, and, and of a group. It makes sense in some aspects. But wow, he's got so much to accomplish on his own. He's too good to just be part of a group. And you get something like Edge, Adam Copeland, and Malachi Black. Come on, man. People are just going to be ripping out their wallets. Which credit card do you want? That's what they're going to be saying. Because that's the match if you do it correctly and you tell that story properly. Give it the time of day. Man, it's so good. That one vid package. Man, that one vid package. It was like, yup, that's Malachi Black. That's the badass dude we remember and should be getting. Because before that, man, lights go out and here comes another six-man tag. Pretty cool way to end our number one. Um, And again, it, it it holds more significance because of what it does for somebody like Malachi. Our number two, we're going to kick off with Swerve Strickland. And there was a swerve by Christian that was in the works. Swerve Strickland and Christian Cage go back and forth with a promo to start the hour. Really well done turn here as the embassy implodes. Brian Cage, Leona Khan, they all turn on Swerve, even cementing this dude through the commentary table, laying him out in a badass way. And at this point, Christian has this smirk on his face. Him and his boys take off to the back. When they get to the back, Christian comes across the Young Bucks. And Christian says, and I quote, thanks, gentlemen. Great idea. It's been a pleasure working with you. Great idea. It's been a pleasure working with you. Makes you think of the Bucks pulling more strings than just the ones that many think they're pulling. 
if that makes sense. So Tony Schiavone was flipping out when he heard that. Did you hear that? He said, great idea. So many layers to this. I love it because you know Swerve cannot drop this championship. Swerve cannot drop this feud to Christian Cage. This is a really good way to stack the deck against Swerve literally and figuratively as Christian is just monopolizing talent and Swerve is on an island all to his lonesome. I love that, especially when you know the champion's got to prevail. But man, you got you to gotta stack that deck. Uh, this is literally the way to do that. So very well done, start of the second hour. Then Jay White pins Rocky Romero via pinfall off Blade Runner. And to add insult to the loss, the dude pinned Rocky with one finger. <laughs> He put one finger on this. Jay White put one finger on Rocky Romero to pin this dude. He done did him filthy. How you gonna do that to Rocky? <laughs> it was great, man. That definitely popped bees. He was covered normal at first, I believe, right? The one count maybe. By two, he was just like, you know what? <laughs> he just fuck with this dude. Oh, that was too funny. Uh, then Jericho and Big Bill uh, defeated... I forgot who they even defeated. I think it was just some local talent, no? I forgot. I had a little bit of side business I had to take care of through that. I was able to catch like the post-match interview that Jericho cut, though, and it was hilarious. He's like, thank you, Calgary. I, I-, I mean, Edmonton. <laughs> he did that on purpose, obviously. Jericho poking at the crowd. Um... So Jericho continues to teach his lessons to this. This one was for Big Bill. I don't know. Not, not too much more was in my notes. But again, that was at a time where I, was, I had to take care of a couple of the other things at the same time. Um, then we went into um, Adam Copeland versus Brody King. Anything goes. No holds barred. I think it was called no DQ, but I mean, this was no holds. I mean, this was, <laughs> listen, in the first five minutes, Brody was sporting the crimson mask. Edge look like he is like literally was in 10 train wrecks. I mean, these two look like they were in a four hour Iron Man match war. <laughs> oh, man. Um, yeah, pretty fun. Brody, uh, Brody ends up eating the. Or taking the L in this one. Edge speared him, I believe, to end this match. There was a badass spear through a table on the outside. And then I think they went back in the inside. Maybe there was another one there. And that's where Edge... Adam Copeland. My bad. It's a, you know. Adam. Adam. Edge. Adam. Edge sounds a little bit more badass. <laughs> Copeland. Um, I think that's where he picked up the W off the spear. Pretty cool. Um, post-match... Um, who was with, was it just Brody? There was a beatdown on, on Copeland afterwards and Kyle O'Reilly hit the ring for the save. And then like when we came back from break in the back, um, Copeland finds out that Riley just did that so he can get a, a, a match himself with Copeland. So Copeland says, Hey, you know what? I like what you did out there. You got a deal. Handshake, mutual respect. Sets up Copeland and Kyle O'Reilly. Um, even though that was the main event, the show was not over yet. Mercedes Monet um, is in the back responding to an earlier promo from Willow Nightingale. Now, Willow is, uh, she's adorable, right? It's hard not to like Willow. And I feel she's just improving every time I see her, too. When I first saw Willow, I was like, eh, a lot of rough around the edges kind of talk. She just keeps improving. Um, and she... She, you know, she was, she's really doing a good job believing in herself, and that helps make others believe that you can possibly, actually defeat Mercedes Monet. The problem with that is, that's complete fabrication. There's no way Mercedes is losing this match, right? Like, could you imagine at double or nothing if Willow, and in all respect, much love to Willow, but could you imagine if Mercedes walks out of Double or Nothing without the championship? So Willow was really 
cutting this promo, like it's more than just belief in myself. It's more than me saying I'm walking out with this title. That's what's happening. It's like Paul Heyman, right? That's not a, a prediction. It's a spoiler. But man, even though Willow's saying the right words, this is Sasha Banks we're talking about. This is Mercedes Monet. One of, and BC says, the best female wrestler on the planet. She's that good. She's everybody's best match. She could go in there and have a, 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 I don't know, Melzi would give it seven stars with a bag of oranges. And somehow Mercedes would make that work. She can have an Iron Man match with a broomstick. <laughs> um, so anyway, man, I'm looking forward to Willow having the match of her career. I really am. I say it all the time. Mercedes is everybody's best match. I look for Mercedes because she got injured in that last one with Willow and there was just a lot of, uh, there was a lot of asterisks in those, in, in that match. And Mercedes actually said that, right? That match we had, there's a huge asterisk. But there was many reasons why that match could have been even better. And, it, it, and aside from just Mercedes' injury, I look for this to be Willow's best match of her career so far. And I'm not going to be shocked that it's with Mercedes. But Mercedes has to walk out with that title. I think we know that. So they had Mercedes. They saved her to the end of the night to respond to Willow's words. And then the night officially ends with the Young Bucks, the Elite, o Okada, Jack Perry, all coming to the ring. And the, the Bucks say, this is a quote, I know the main event is over, but this show doesn't end until we say it does. I love the Bucks running the show. This show, the main, I love that placement. The main event is done. You think the show is over. It's actually like 10 p.m. Eastern time at that point because when I saw the replay, it was an exact two-hour point. So that had to have been 10 p.m. Eastern time. So right there, you know that like when they say this show doesn't end until we say it does and it's past the allotted time, I mean, you can believe that more, right? It fits. Main event is done, and these dudes come parading out now? That's something The Rock would do. Over in the E. So that was great, man. I know the main event is over, but this show doesn't end until we say it does. Um, and then they did just deliver that message to Tony Khan, and I quote, We were never here to hurt AEW. We were trying to make AEW a better place. So this narrative, like Kenny Omega, you know, Team AEW versus the Elite. As if the elite are the ultimate bad guys. But they're trying to say, we've never been anti-AEW. We're not trying to hurt the company. We're trying to make this place better. And basically saying, Tony Khan's getting in the way. You are getting in the way. So they accept Kenny Omega's uh, anarchy in the arena challenge for double or nothing. And then their partners are revealed to be Eddie Kingston and Brian Danielson. Who hasn't been seen in, not months, weeks, right? What was his last? It was only a few weeks, but they made it sound like, like Brian's been gone for a long time. So Danielson and Kingston, and then there's an all-out brawl to end the show. Elite, Perry, Okada, Kingston, Danielson, FTR, because they were out there first to introduce Danielson and, and Kingston. Hopefully you guys are keeping track. And then there's a brawl and we go off the air. So I, I liked it, man. I liked, I just love the placement. Main event's done. You think the show's over. No, Mercedes has some words. And then you're going to get the culmination of the story before with the challenge for anarchy in the arena at Double or Nothing. So I just love it. Like plant seeds during the show and come back to them toward the end of the show. Simplistic. And if you do that correctly, you have an actual television show, right? A television show is a sequence of segments and scenes that you follow along and hopefully it builds in climax, right? It builds your your intrigue and you get to a point where you have that climactic moment and hopefully if done correctly you have a cliffhanger to keep going the next week and so on anyway guys that's what i got for you dynamite 5824 if there's one word i could use to describe this show at least in terms of looking toward the future of aw dynamite more specifically it would be interesting and that's a good thing, right? Interesting. A lot of good things were planted last night. What they grow into remains to be seen. But that's a good start, man. Uh, you know, it's been rough for AEW as of late. Uh, this could be a start 
of really good things going forward if they keep this up, right? Stay the course, stay focused, and just kick ass, man. You know, have fun more than anything. Have fun. That's when you're really going to peak and take off. Until next time, and there will be that next time. Top guys, we are out. BC and his amplified unit saying, check you. Peace.